uh, rain up here and sometimes the internet doesn't play friendly when we are when it's raining. So yes, we're gonna be talking about remote provisioning today. Um, there's actually a number of different things that, that we can consider as part of the conversation around remote provisioning, right? Um, it can be anything from deploying an app to a remote user that we can't see all the way through to deploying a physical device that the user can't see or that we can't see. Uh, it actually can even include uh, potentially creating kiosk devices in remote locations where we want to have users be able to walk up. Uh, but again, you know, due to the current nature of things in these uncertain times, right, uh, we may not be able to send an IT person out to go and touch that machine and walk it through the process. So what we've seen companies do over the last year or so is is try to take existing tools and and reconfigure the way that they work to match the requirement and sometimes it works pretty well uh, but sometimes you end up with a situation where uh, you know in order to first deploy a machine you have to receive it into your your physical branch location someone's got to take it to a secret lab with a network cable connect it touch the domain controller install a whole bunch of apps they have to log on as the user several times, do a whole bunch of stuff, reset the user's password, put it in a box, and then ship it. So you shipped it twice. You've sent the IT person into the office. You put their hands all over the machine. Uh, and what we find is that that, that process can take uh, several days to get a machine deployed, which means that the HR process has to extend a little bit to, to get that user onboarded so that they can have a machine day one. Um, and we did have one organization tell us that they were buying uh, machines costing about $1,000 per, per user and that the cost of getting the machines first shipped to the central office, second the person in, third, you know, all the time involved and then shipping it back out, plus disinfecting and all that other fun stuff, was adding a, a, a time and labor cost of about $1,000. So there was thousand dollar machines instantly became two thousand dollar machines before the user ever even got a hold of it to do the first day worth of work. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to explore how we can use Intune uh, to basically do all of that stuff and really cut out the vast majority of the, the backscatter. And while we're doing that, I'm going to be showing you some stuff that's in my, my demo environment here. Uh, we've also got Miriam Graham's brand new computer. Today is her first day at Contoso. We're very excited to have her here. Uh, but when I deployed her machine the other day, right, because this is a 30 minute event and I wanted to make sure we had time to do this, I, I actually recorded my screen of deploying her machine with a clock, with a, with a stopwatch here. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you that some of the, the, the key moments that we're looking for here are uh, at the 37 second mark into the video, we're going to have uh, the machine at her first login screen. This machine has never been touched before. The thought is that we had the, the vendor directly shipped this, shipped this machine straight to Miriam. We've done all the work on the back end. Uh, we want Miriam to have the first touch of this actual device. And we're leveraging some really cool tools to do that. Uh, and while her machine is deploying on the background here, I'm going to show you what some of those tools are. So I mentioned that that sometimes we really we really want to start this at a very basic level. What we really want to do is be able to deploy applications to our users wherever they may be, right? Whether they're in the office or whatever, they've they you know, they've, they've got a machine that's under some sort of management. We want to deploy apps to it. We can use Intune to do that. It's a very simple thing to do. We can come in here and decide what the application type is. Uh, whether it's, you know, we're just pushing Office 365 there are, you know, Microsoft apps to it. If we're pushing line of business or Win32 apps to these users. And what's really nice is that we can also push things from the Microsoft Store. And the integration there is, is pretty nice because what it allows me to do is to come over to the Microsoft Store for business, tie it to my Intune. There's a, there's a tenant connector to do that. And then I can just go through and light up the applications that I want my users to have. And I can also light up the applications that I want my users to never have. Uh, I can set these things up so that you know, if these applications are detected, to just rip them back off. Uh, I'm pushing all these wonderful applications. Some of them are, are uh, some of them I'm just making available in the store in case my users want to go and self-deploy them to themselves. Uh, you might have some choices about how you want to, you know, how you want to service the users. Um, but simply having these in this store 
adds them through a synchronization process to my Intune apps. And this is where I'm going to come through and set up my rules. So uh, plenty of people have seen me go through through this process in my in my uh, immersion experiences. But what I do is I take the applications that I don't want to find on a machine. And yeah, I know this is a, uh, an iOS one, but I simply come over here and say it's an unex it's a required uninstall for certain devices. Uh, maybe I'm going to look uh, the uh, Mermaid Princess one here. We want to just make sure that our device isn't being used, uh, you know, for Mermaid Princesses. Uh, looks like, oh, I actually haven't set up an assignment for this one. Well, anyway, we have a lot of different ways that we can define these these applications, right? Uh, but we can also go and take, like I said, these Win32 apps or line of business apps, and we can deploy these to our users too. And we have a ton of different ways that we can do this, uh, and we can track who's got it, who doesn't. Uh, let's see. Oh, check it back in with Miriam over here. It looks like her device has already been joined to the Azure Active Directory. Uh, we're about two minutes into the, you know, almost three minutes into the process. I happen to know that in about 15 seconds, her machine is going to show up uh, as fully joined and it's going to start deploying apps to her. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, Chrome, in this particular environment, I have said I want it to be available for all users, but if you're in a, a high risk group, I want to uninstall it. Now, at this point, it's just free in the wild, right? My users can then go into their computer and they can fire up the company store, the, the company portal app, which is in my environment, pre-pinned for my users right here. Uh, they go into this company portal app and they can decide to self-service any application that I have made available to them. So we're gonna give this a moment for Miriam to fire up her company portal app. In the meantime, we can see if we, uh, we zoom in a little bit here that we are now installing applications on her machine over here. So we're going to let that continue to, to bake. Uh, OK, so she's got a corporate device and we're going to jump in here and we're going to see all the applications that we have made available to Miriam. Uh, hey, it looks like as, as administrators, as administrators, we've decided that we want to feature some applications for her to say, hey, maybe you want to start here. So we will literally do this right now. We will say, you know what? I'm a Google Chrome user and I want to self deploy Google Chrome. OK, no big deal. That's going to run in the background while we are doing other things. We'll be able to see. Whoops, if I uh, make that a little bit smaller, we'll be able to see other things happening too. There we go. We'll let that just sit off on the side there. And actually, then I bring my video back up too so we can see that. So all these things are happening and all this wonderful stuff and hopefully uh, we'll be able to keep going here. Uh, where is my thing? Here we go. So we're deploying applications, right? We can deploy them whether they are a part of uh, our, our app gallery here or we can actually, like I said, we can tie this to the Microsoft Store for Business so we can let users automatically get things. We can also forcibly install applications. Um, and the way that I'm doing that in my environment is actually rolled up through another thing called policy sets that we'll get to in a minute. But I also do push the Office Pro Plus application set to my users. I want to make sure that everybody's working with the same version of Office Pro Plus in the environment. Uh, I can see that 14 of my machines have it. Two don't have it yet. And maybe I want to check on that and figure out a little bit more about why. But in this environment, I simply have it set that all devices get it. Unless you happen to be running on a privilege access workstation or a kiosk, right? Other than that, everybody should get this the Office Pro Plus 64 bit. And it's not up to the user at this point. I am simply forcing it on there. And the way that I've got this particular one deployed, uh, it's set to see uh, if there is another version of it installed. It's going to rip it off. It's going to put this on. So if they have like a personal version or anything on there, it's going to remove that. It's going to overlay our preferred Office Pro Plus. Now, since we're talking about Office Pro Plus, oh, look at that. Google Chrome is now installed for Miriam Graham. Look at that. While we're talking, we can now come down here and just start Google Chrome. That took what, two, three minutes maybe? Self deployed. We gave you, Miriam, the authority to take care of the application deployments that she wants. All right. So, all right, we've got this stuff going on. Um, we can also come in here and do the, the traditional Office configuration server requirements that we used to be able to do uh, in a separate space. That's now all integrated. So, if I've deployed Office and now I also want to deploy a, a big configuration on top of that, I can simply hit uh, you know, the configuration, set the policies, and I can define all of the process or the, all the, the configuration policies that I want to within my user's group, uh, you know, Office environment. And I can target this so I can have multiple different ones for different groups of folks. 
So now I can do the apps and now I can also do the configuration of the apps. But I can also decide how far my users should be able to take the data that they produce in those apps. So I've got my Office Pro Plus applications deployed to my users. Let me make sure you can still see uh, my oops again. Double clicking on the Internet, man. You think I learned better by now? Apparently not. So all right, we're still deploying apps on this guy. Uh, I'm going to come in and look at what Miriam is going to be allowed to do with the data that she uses in those Office apps. So it looks like if it's data that's inside any of these applications, we're going to wrap a DLP policy around that content that says that those that data is going to be protected and won't be able to be moved to other applications. So whether she tries to copy paste that uh, a, a line of text out of you know uh, Outlook and put it into Gmail or what, it's not going to allow her to do that. So we can define now the applications whether or not we're pushing the applications or the users can self-service them. We're defining the policies that are going to govern the use of the applications and where the applications can move their data. And we've never touched the machine. This is 100% just being defined for our users, right? And here's Miriam. She's still deploying her brand new machine. You can see that we are actually pulling down a lot of data. So while it says it's deploying app two of three over here, it really is actually doing that. It's not sitting around waiting for us. OK, so we've got a bunch of apps that we've gotten sitting out here, but that's great. We're not forcing her to come in over a VPN or anything to get to these apps, but we actually now need to expand this to giving her a real device. So for enrolling a device, we need to set some policies about how she's going to be able to do that, right? Uh, maybe we want to support some automatic enrollment. Maybe we want Miriam to be able to go and get her own machine, right? Uh, maybe we don't want to do that. But we can also support, like I mentioned, direct shipping a device to the user. Now, that's what's going to leverage uh, Windows Autopilot. The Autopilot program is what's going to allow us to work with a hardware vendor and give them a, a purchase order for X number of new machines. We can even give them the, the recipient's address to where to ship the machine. And they're going to reach into our Windows Store for Business, our Microsoft Store for Business, and when they're there, they're going to enter some information about these machines. They're going to basically pre-enroll these devices for us into our autopilot program. Once those machines are in the autopilot program, when these users unpack these machines and, and set them up, the very first thing that it will do once it gets on a network is try to reach out to the Windows Store for Business or Microsoft Store for Business. And it will say, ah, this serial number or this IMEI belongs to this company and it will constrain that out of box experience for the user so that they are only allowed to type in our domains credentials or our, our um, Azure AD's credentials, right? Or we can even get so very granular that we only let them to use, use the credentials of the specific user that we're shipping it to. I'm not going to go that far. And in fact, you can see I'm not really even doing that in this environment because the autopilot um, program will only actually allow me to constrain a few elements. So if I look in and see what these elements really are, it's really just the stuff before the user logs in. OK, so let me get to uh, looking at you can see okay, I can do all these different profiles. Uh, I'm going to look at this one. I'm going to be able to skip Cortana, OneDrive and registration pages, uh, automatically set up the account for work or school, right? Uh, we're going to skip the privacy settings page and we're going to skip the EULA page. OK, that's not a whole lot, but once that's done. Autopilot hands off to Intune to do all the rest, so I'm going to jump back over to my Intune, and here we see three of these same uh, profiles. I literally just created the Contoso one within Autopilot side on Microsoft Store for Business. I don't think it's where we want to really do it. We really want to create these profiles here. Uh, again, they're not doing a whole heck of a lot, right? They're really only constraining the, the environment before we really even get into this. A couple of little things that may, may peek, uh, peek back through here. But once Intune gets a hold of it, Intune is then going to put the user into what we call the, uh, the enrollment.
Adrian, are you okay? Yeah, it looks. But you can't hear me, apparently. No, I can hear you. It buffered for a second. I was just making it on. It's just checking. That was the first time, though. I know. Oh, you can hear me? Today. Okay. Well, can you see my screen? Because it keeps telling yeah. me that I'm off. Oh, now I'm back online. All right. What a mess. Man, too much rain. It's frozen, but All it's right. there. Okay. When you can see it moving again. I will. Humblest, humblest apologies. It's Every once in a while, we run into a little bit of a glitch. It's been uh, pretty rough the last couple of days. Yeah. Are you able to oh, see my yeah, screen? No. Or I'll, actually, yeah. I'll stop sharing and reshare. The timing on the right. the live recording of the remote provision you did for the laptop is on 11 minutes and 39 seconds for Miriam. Perfect. That's exact. I stopped it because I didn't want to. I didn't want to lose okay. anything. But actually, yep. I will jump ahead a little bit because I happen to know that at here we go. 1248, you can see all three apps have deployed and I'm going to finish doing this. OK, so right, we're Marianne's back. <laughs> back in. This thing is working through. We can see that it, at 13 minutes we're rebooting. The user hasn't really done anything. They've logged in one time. They're going to get prompted to authenticate again with, for the final touch to log in uh, and the and and I and at 14, actually like uh, 17 minutes and 30 seconds, the user will be into their full desktop environment. So they're getting the privacy settings. Uh, they're going to be prompted to uh, provide credentials. Uh, it's going to go through. All right. While Miriam is finishing her deployment over here, uh, I'm going to come back through and talk about the fact that we, once we've decided how we want to constrain the enrollment for the user, we're then going to feed them into how we're going to process all these different configuration profiles. And this is basically what we would have spent all of our years doing, building our GPOs in Azure or, or in Active Directory. Dropped in over here, we're going to then decide whether or not to apply conditional access policies, uh, how many devices Miriam's going to be able to bring to bear in this environment. And we're going to take all of that and we're going to wrap it up in a policy set. And I absolutely love policy sets. I've gone on about them uh, many times over in different environments. But a policy set is really what's governing this whole deployment right now. Miriam simply logged in. My policy set in here is what's forcing Office Pro Plus onto this machine. It's enforcing that these device management and configuration profiles get deployed. It's saying that there are no particular enrollment status, status page requirements, which is why in a moment over here, you'll see this continue anyway button. We can keep a user from being able to continue anyway and keep them in this environment until we're deployed or delivered a full uh, functioning office or a Windows environment. So I'm going to skip forward because I know the video is broken. There we go. Uh, 1735, we can see that she's got that continue anyway button here. Again, we can turn that off. Um, it's deploying applications to her so she can uh, you know, finish deploying whatever she needs. Uh, but now we need to understand what is actually going on for this user, right? So we want to know, we want to be able to help Miriam because she's going to call up and say that something isn't working right. And what's really nice here is that I can find her machine very quickly. And let's see, by just finding her name in the list, Miriam G. This is her machine. Um, I'm going to be able to take a look and see all the properties of the machine, all the hardware that's in here, make sure she got the right machine, right? Um, we can actually query all the applications that are installed query the state of compliance assessment on her machine, query which configuration profiles have occurred and haven't. Uh, in fact, and, and even if we have one that hasn't, we can figure out why it hasn't. We can see the, sta the status of all these particular uh, settings. Uh, let's see, we can look at the configuration of any applications, if there are any. We can even deploy security baselines to these devices and track and see if that's being handled correctly track recovery keys because we can manage BitLocker from Intune as well. Uh, we can even get information and insights about the user experience, right? Uh, we shipped her this brand new machine. How long is it taking on average for it to get to a sign-in screen? And then how long is it taking to get to a responsive desktop phase? So we can get all this wonderful diagnostics now. Uh, in fact, including specifically device diagnostic capabilities that we have here. And we know we deployed several applications to her. Are they working? Yes, it looks like they sure are. In fact, this is part of this is one of the applications that I have the forced install on and I can get reporting on very granularly 
how well did it did the install work? What's going on here? She, we know she just clicked on Chrome and we can see that the application was created at 1050 uh, her time. Uh, it's checking in, but it hasn't yet reported back to Intune that she has it installed. That will very shortly. So there we go. 19 minutes, 40 seconds. Miriam has a full functioning Windows desktop computer at Contoso. I had done nothing else with this machine until we started today. If I fire up Edge, it's going to have all the applications or all the, the websites pre-pinned that she wants to work with. If I look at the start bar, it's going to have all the applications pre-pinned to the start bar based on those configuration profiles that I had set up earlier. If I browse her computer, and again, I've done no further touches on this machine, she is going to have uh, her OneDrive for Business pre-synced, pre-loaded, pre-configured with everything that she has already worked with today. I have done no touches other than logging in as Miriam, uh, what, twice, I think? Um, and that's it. That's 100% of remote provisioning. Now, if I absolutely had to get her into some sort of an on-premise application, uh, we could certainly deploy uh, a Azure connector that might that would allow her to see that application through an Azure Active Directory web app proxy. Uh, but we can also, as Miriam, we can fire up our, our browser here. Oh, yeah, it wants me to sign in and synchronize. OK, we'll do that. And then because it's doing that, I'm actually going to close Edge and reopen it. Outlook is firing up here. It's loading the profile, right? It's not asking me to create a profile. It's simply loading the profile. So all of this is being done through the configuration changes that we made in Intune. So uh, truly 19 minutes, 47 seconds, Miriam is up and running. Now this machine's slow because it's a VM on my computer, but she's done, right? She's ready to be productive in 19 minutes, 47 seconds with all of our company mandated applications pushed and ready for her to work with. Um, we are not covering Windows Virtual Desktop today, although that is a very valid alternate path to getting users up and deploy quickly. We actually did do a webinar on Windows Virtual Desktop uh, back in January. Uh, it was hosted by uh, Dan Finn from our team in conjunction with Nerdio. I highly encourage you to check that out if that's uh, a method that you would find uh, preferable. Uh, but, but I mean, we're 20 minutes into it and and she's up and running. That's that has cut down dramatically on the time it takes for us to deploy machines to users in our environment and in many other environments. Uh, highly encourage you guys to, to go check out what you can do uh, to get started with these same methods and same processes and really reduce that lag time to user productivity. Um, I'm happy to open it up to any questions that you, you guys may have. I'm going to continue to play as Miriam for another minute or so just so you can kind of see like how things continue to evolve for her as she goes. Uh, but like I said, happy to open it up for any questions. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I know with the weather today, we hit a bit of a side, but um, that was great. Honestly, we got through it. And um, for the, if anyone's wondering, the Windows Virtual Desktop um, webinar that Adrian's referencing, you can find that as an on-demand webinar under our events page on our website. Um, and he actually just released a blog yesterday, Building Sandcastles in the Dark, um, around uh, deploying systems to remote users. So similar topic, but I think, but a bit different. Um, but not seeing any questions in the chat box if anyone wants to drop any in. Um, actually, I'm gonna just mention right here that I've actually also taken a number of my web apps that I've deployed in, uh, in, in Intune and categorize them so that I could then publish them. So when my users go to all apps up here, they now actually have multiple tabs they can go through to to pick out the application groups that they want to. Uh, and I can target this at different users as well. So if my users are 100% pure web based, uh, we can actually really give them a nice sculpted environment where they can come through and find, get quickly to the apps, apps that they want to get to. So just thought I'd throw that out there. No, yeah, you're good. Sorry, no, I interrupt me anytime. Um, I thought it was really cool watching the recording of the actual like live deployment of Miriam's computer while you were just like walking through. Like it just in the back end was I, I thought that was really cool. I like the timers. Um, but um, with that, unless Adrian, you got anything else? Um, interrupt me anytime, but um, crushed it as always. And thank you everyone for attending today. You will receive a follow up email with the recording to this webinar by tomorrow. Um, 
Be sure to keep up with us on social and check our events page for more upcoming webinars. Uh, like I said, that Windows Virtual Desktop webinar is uh, on demand on our events page right now. Um, and yeah, thank you again for joining us. There were not any questions in the Q&A, so unless anyone wants to pop one in, um, I think we're good. And Adrian, um, thank you as always. Sure, uh, apologies again for the two outages. That That's... That, yeah, that was a first. That was... I. Was Sorry. Yeah. No, it's, well, I mean, it's technology. It's always on the but, but the weather's also awful today. So it just got, we got, we made the most of it. We did it. But um, I thank you guys so much for attending and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye bye.